This video covers investment policy statements. An investment policy statement is a living document that summarizes life's long-term goals and develops a map to reach these goals. Now, how is this relevant to you? Well, there's several ways that this is relevant to you. Uh, first off, in this course, you're going to be asked to write an investment policy statement and hand it in in the first couple of weeks of the semester. Uh, you're going to actually implement this investment policy statement using StockTrack. So you're going to write an investment policy statement and what it's going to do is it's going to map out um, and, and is a, a way to um, get at you how to save. How are you going, how are you going to save till uh, retirement? Most of it, you know, most of you are going to want to look over your entire life, forecast out and think about hmm, when do I want to retire? How much money am I going to need? And how am I going to get there? That's what the map aspect of this is. And then over your life, things change. Um, and that's why this is a living document. It, it um, continues and carries with you over your life. So that's the, that's the immediate need of, of understanding what investment policy statements are all about. Um, then in, you also have... Um, a personal aspect to this if you you know a, you may not be a finance person but you certainly will need to save money and and um, and invest over your life and so you can look at this as helping you in your own personal life managing your own money uh, the other thing the, the other way that this policy statement is relevant to you is if you want to go into the financial planning business and become a financial planner if you become a financial planner you'll be writing investment policy statements for your clients and um, and you'll have to update those and change those about every year you should be meeting with your clients at least once a year uh, to, to see what's going on in their life and what's happening in the financial markets and monitor to make sure that that the person's meeting their their goals now in this class um, I, I hope that your client is you. Um, so when you write an investment policy statement, the client is you. It could be an imaginary client that you develop. I, I don't really care, but well, I, I do care. I, I prefer that you write it on yourself so it's, it's more practical. And, and uh, I think you'll spend more time on it and it'll be well worth it. Now, let's get into it, the statement. Um, the first thing you, you want to know is here that individuals tend to follow a life cycle uh, and this life cycle is graphed out here and notice here that we have uh, on the y-axis we have net worth and on the x-axis we have age and so this is a typical person um, obviously not everybody fits this mold but um, it's nice to think about this as being a, um, um, as, as maybe where you want to go now look early on in your in here around your early 20s and in your early 20s you're in the accumulation phase all the way up to your mid 30s or so and uh, you're you're investing for long term obviously for your retirement and college children's college needs um, also a house um, and that would be short term. Hopefully, you'd be wanting to, you'd be considering buying a house relatively soon, or you know, buying a house before you retire. And so that's why house and a car are there as short term uh, goals that you're going to need to fund. Now, as you get older, you accumulate some money in your mid 30s. You have something to accumulate. Then you have a consolidation phase here, and that goes from your mid 30s up to your mid to upper 50s typically and again long-term nature of this investing is for your retirement it's also can short to, on a short-term basis fund vacations and children's college needs by that time the kids may be in college and you're actually paying those bills then somewhere in your mid to late 50s here you end up um, you peak out on your net worth this is on average people tend to peak out at this point their, their salaries are, are very high, they're, they're highly productive, um, they've spent a lot of years in the workforce, and it peaks out somewhere, depending on when you decide to retire. 
and then you end up in the spending phase here or the gifting phase and so long term and I would say long term you still have you know you're investing for your retirement at that point you have at least 20 or 25 years expected life on average and so uh, say saving for your or managing your investment portfolio for retirement is still uh, applicable you may want to do estate planning thinking about where your money is going to go where you're going to gift your money and um, you know and, and also just fund your your general retirement and, and gifts uh, possibly to your kids now um, the most immediate goal a tangible goal in investment policy statement is to derive an asset allocation and divide as a strategy behind it so here's a typical asset allocation just made it up uh, it's not very far from what you find from a large financial institution like a Merrill Lynch or a Bank of America if you went there uh, or any investment planner downtown in, in Portland and so you have uh, an asset allocation lists the major asset classes and the asset classes are defined by the type of risk that they're exposed to and because that type of risk will help define the returns that you're going to get from those assets so the first one I have listed here is the most liquid and that's cash slash money market and it may be 10% of your portfolio overall and so uh, you should have some money aside for emergency purposes and for liquidity purposes and that's what this 10% cash money market balance represents um, those terms are synonymous cash and money market so if you read the Wall Street Journal listen to CNBC and the investors are telling you that they have 10% in cash it really means that they have their money parked. it could be in Treasury bills uh, which are a form of money market uh, or some other type of very short-term liquid assets which we'll be talking about um, throughout the semester uh, forty percent could be in stocks um, and stocks uh, is a very broad asset class uh, you'd want to narrow it you, you'd actually want to define stocks a little better and there's uh, many dimensions in which you could define stocks you could define define stocks in terms of being value versus growth uh, value stocks or stocks that we that you think somehow using some type of model that the stocks are undervalued so they're value they're a value at this point and they're going to appreciate in value growth stocks on the other hand are stocks that you expect to have high growth rates and what do you expect to grow what, what do you expect to have high growth rates in well ultimately it's the cash flow that the company throws off and so you'd be looking at younger stocks that that will have high growth potential and it turns out as we'll find out later in the semester is that when st stocks have high growth rates the stock price grows at that fast pace also okay. there's also you know you can look at stocks from an international perspective you can look at stocks from from a small cap perspective mid cap perspective and large cap perspective small cap means small capitalization price of the shares times the number of shares outstanding it's a gauge of the size of a company in terms of its market value so you can think of small cap meaning small market values for companies companies that are small and large caps you've, you know many large caps their household names it could be Disney it could be Microsoft and Apple or large cap stocks um, because they have a price and they have many 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 shares associated with each share price there's also a category bonds and this is another very broad asset class and it could be made up of municipal bonds that are issued by states and municipalities tend to be tax exempt at the federal level could be treasury bonds that are issued by the federal government it could be corporate bonds issued by corporations um, and within corporate bonds there's um, many different uh, grades and you know you can have triple a double a and so on you can have junk bonds and which are high yield bonds you can have convertible bonds bonds that convert into stocks so it's a huge asset class um, and, and so 
it, you should have some of your money in stock track devoted to bonds. Now, if you're in your early 20s, I wouldn't advise you in real life to have much money in bonds uh, because the returns are fairly low, stable, typically. And so uh, in the long run, you don't really need that stability. You need to take on a fair amount of risk so you have a decent amount of return. You can ride out the waves of the stock market because you have a 40-year uh, time horizon. Okay. Now, um, so I would I would shy away in real life from bonds, but in stock track I would be investing in them so you learn something about how to buy them and and how they're and how they're moving in the market and how they're reacting to the news events over the semester. Uh, the same thing goes with commodities. Commodities are typically a small part of most people's uh, portfolios. If it, and it could be darn close to zero. Uh, but for stock track, it would be nice if you did buy some type of commodities, again, for the learning experience. Um, and what I mean by commodities are typically uh, futures contracts is one way to go. And that would be, you know, it could be corn, wheat, oil, silver. Um, and so you could take positions there. You can go through an exchange traded fund uh, or a mutual fund that invests in commodities. You could... And um, this this is you know subjective. You you could buy, um, the, for example, Alcoa, which is an aluminum company um, that that specializes in in the production of a commodity and the mining of a commodity like aluminum, um, and, and that could be a stock that's connected to the commodity market. You could also uh, have a real estate component, and you probably will have a real estate component. Um, if you buy a house, you have an investment in real estate. You could also buy real estate investment trusts. Um, some people would leave real estate off your asset allocation because they're only looking at liquid investments that you're going to need uh, for retirement or, to, or to, to buy something in the future. They'd leave real estate out of it, um, but others will include it. So I have it listed here. Um, Obviously, you can't buy a house in stock track, but you can buy uh, real estate investment trusts and mutual funds and exchange traded funds. Uh, if you don't know what a mutual fund or exchange traded fund is, you will, and we'll get to uh, a later chapter. Okay. Let's look at an overview of investment policy statements. So, so now, after after you develop an asset allocation and a strategy, and, and so the strategy is. Um, you know, develop those weights, those percentages, which add up to 100%. Um, and it's go those weights are going to be driven by uh, your your strategy, how much risk and, and where do you think the markets are going to do best in the future so you meet your, your long-term goals. And so you're, let's look at the outline of the steps needed here for writing an investment policy statement. So the first step is you're going to determine and document the investor, the client's expectations. Remember, the client would be you, and it should be you in stock track in this, in this course, but it doesn't have to be. It's a planning step. So you're going to document the client's expectations. And I'll, I'll, each one of these steps I'll, I'll clarify in upcoming slides. Step two is determine the investor's risk and return objectives and constraints that they face. Document them, and that's really important. The documentation uh, it shows up in the first and second steps here. It's extremely important. Studies show that people who write down and document their goals and their expectations are the people who are more likely to meet those goals and expectations. The people who do not document and write down their goals tend not to ever achieve them. And that's just human, human nature there. Item 3 says determine, determine your um, asset allocation strategy. This is a planning step. Okay. Now, um, item 4 is execute the asset allocation strategy. You'll be doing that in stock track. So when you tell me that you have 40% invested in stocks according to your asset allocation, well, that translates into $400,000 worth of stocks that are going to show up in your portfolio in stock track. 
And so you're going to execute things through StockTrack and pull in the trigger, so to speak, and buying assets to match up your asset allocation. Five, you're going to measure and evaluate your performance relative to the objectives. And that's, this is a feedback step. Um, this is what you're going to do throughout the semester uh, in, in conjunction with item six, which is monitor the investor's objectives and the capital market conditions over time. You're going to be looking at your portfolio and you're going to be looking at the market and you're going to be seeing, you know, am I achieving my goals? Now, I understand that the semester, it's, the semester is only three months, less than three months. Uh, and, and, well, it's a little more than three months. But still, it's extremely short term. And you're looking at investing horizons over 40 years. So you don't want to make any major changes in reality, in, in real life. Um, based on the very short-term moves. You don't want to be have knee-jerk reactions to you know one day's worth of, of events in the financial markets and move your portfolio around significantly. But nevertheless, we're constrained by the by a semester. And so you know I, I'm looking for you to look at, evaluate your portfolio, look at the financial markets, and make some adjustments as you see fit. Um, Again, it's a simulation, so you can react a bit to what's going on in the markets. Okay, so let's look at step one a little more carefully. And that was determine and document the investor's expectations to the economy and financial markets. Reasonable expectations are important, um, and you may have to, it, it's going to take you a little bit of while if you're unfamiliar with the financial markets to determine what exactly is reasonable. You'll have a better sense at the end of the semester what reasonable is. And I say reasonable, it's like, you know, how much do you expect on average to make in a given year well, in the stock market or in the bond market? And um, I can tell you right off the top of my head, you know, you ex expect in the stock market if you have a broad portfolio of, of stocks expect you know ballpark 12 percent that includes capital gains and dividend returns in there dividend yield so it's a total return perspective but about 12 percent bonds that will be substantially less now keep in mind um, that's that's ex ante I'm thinking ahead what do I expect to get over the next year as time goes forward and we approach next year, anything could have happened. The stock market could have crashed. I could have lost 50%. I could have gained 50%. So that's risk. That's what risk is all about. But what do I expect? And my expectations, I think, say 12% for the stock market is reasonable because over the past 80 years, that's about where the stock market has performed, about 12% per year. Now, let's look at this planning um, when you're looking at coming up with reasonable forecasts, you should do you should look at it from a comprehensive point of view, what's called a top-down perspective. You start broad, worldwide, and then you move to this specific. Let me give you an example and narrow this down. It's kind of like a funnel, very wide at the top, and you're going down and narrowing it, narrowing it, narrowing it down to you actually make an investment. So um, you you need to, or you should somehow, forecast the economic growth for all major countries. Select the most, most attractive countries to invest in. You know, so you may look at, well, you know, Europe is, 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 is teetering. Um, they're, we're not sure if they're going to be in a recession or not at this point. It's early 2015. Uh, China's growth has slowed. Um, it's still positive, but it slowed down. People are worried about various bubbles in their economy, in, in the real estate market, for example. Um, their Federal Reserve, the, the Bank of China, is um, implementing monetary policy to try to head off any an economic downturn. Um, we have Russia. Russia is is um, in a recession, and it doesn't look like it's going to pull out for a while, especially with oil prices having dropped so much. At the moment, oil prices are now, uh, back in, you know, six months ago, they were around $100 a barrel. They're below $50 a barrel. And so that means uh, huge revenue losses for Russia because one of Russia's main exports is oil. So what does that leave us with? Well, it leaves us with the United States as being a, a, 
um, ha having good economic prospects at the moment. So that's what you may want to zero in. Now, you may want to bottom fish and look for particular, within particular countries, particular stocks, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, even in a down market, in a recession, there's always good stocks to buy. Now, second bullet here is, within each selected country, determine which asset classes are acceptable investments. Okay? For example, you may think U.S. stocks and bonds are acceptable so, and you may want to yeah, I don't want to do real estate uh, it's overpriced in, in right now it's pro, it's generally not overpriced unless you go to specific markets in certain cities you might think it's overpriced then now within each asset class determine what categories are acceptable you know maybe I want value stocks within stocks and I want intermediate corporate bonds um, Intermediate meaning that you know they range it could be from two to ten years bonds in terms of their maturity. Then within now that you want value stocks and you want intermediate bonds, you might want to look at acceptable sectors, and maybe you want to go into and look at um, fin financial sector, for example, with stocks. And you think, well, they've been depressed lately. Um, not really. Uh, they've they've come back at this point. Um, but you don't know where they're going, so do you want to go into the financial sector? Maybe you want to. Now, uh, bullet two here says determine acceptable industries. So we're going even narrower. So we're looking at the financial sector. Now we're looking at, for example, money center banks are within the financial sector. Because remember, the financial sector is, is, is huge. The financial sector could even could be brokerage firms, it could be money center banks, it could be regional banks, and so on. So here we're going to center in on, on money center banks. And then the last bullet says, later in an execution step, and based on a specific asset allocation, you want to determine an acceptable company to invest in. So you could go to Citigroup, you know, because, oh, I think it has a low PE, you know, around 10, price earnings ratio. You may not know or recall what that represents, but we'll cover that a lot through in this semester. It's basically a method of valuation. Remember, I said, you know, a couple bullet points back that we wanted to look at value stocks. You need a, a method of determining whether or not a stock is over or undervalued. The easiest, simplest way to do that, and a very dangerous way, look, looking at just just the ratio in and of itself is the P-E ratio. Um, we'll talk about that throughout this semester. Okay. Now, I should back up one second here. Um, this top-down approach would take you forever to do on your own. By the time you figured out what countries to invest and boil it down to the sectors and get down to specific companies, and it doesn't have to be specific companies. It could be in particular exchange-traded funds or mutual funds um, that you want to go into. It will take you a long time. But by the time you figure it out, the markets will have changed and your decisions will have changed. So how do you how do you actually implement this? Well, if you talk to people downtown in, in the old port, talk to anybody who's in financial planning, they, they buy newsletters and other uh, news sources and subscriptions that um, that summarize this type of information frequently. So they'll 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 have newsletters that will tell them here's the um, here's the countries that you want to be looking at and here's why and here's the risks associated with the various countries. So it's basically done for you. All that research is done for you, and so you can narrow things down quite quickly using those newsletters. In fact, those newsletters will even boil it right down not only from the go from a country, but it'll go down right down the specific stocks for you. Um, but you still want to do your homework. You still want to look at those carefully and use your judgment. Okay, step two. Determine the client's risk and return objectives. And you need to differentiate between the ability and willingness to take risk. The ability to take risk is a function of the client's required spending needs, time horizon, long-term wealth targets, stage of life, and financial strength. Okay, what is this all about here? Required spending needs. That's how much money an individual needs, um, for example, to live off of when they retire. If you uh, are used to a... Um, 
a low standard of living, you're not going to have much spending needs. If you're used to flying high and spending, uh, having a quite elaborate and luxurious lifestyle, then your spending needs are going to be high. And so your ability to, uh, to take risk will be a function of, of your, your spending needs. If you have spend, high spending needs, think about it. It's going to require when it's going to require um, cash flow and liquidity which means you're probably going to have to invest in lower risk assets. It's the assets that uh, do not throw off any cash flow that tend to have high expected returns. So you go into growth stocks, young company growth stocks. They don't pay any dividends. There's no cash flow associated with it. But those companies don't have the ability to pay the cash flow, so they're quite risky. Um, but over the long run, they tend to have a high expected return. Um, your ability to take risk is a function of your time horizon. And that means, you know, how long am I from how long am I going to need this money that I'm saving for? Am I going to need this money for the down payment of a house? And if that's the case, and the down payments within the next couple of years, you can't afford to take much risk. That money should be invested in some type of bond mutual fund, uh, or even in a money market portfolio or asset class. Uh, because you can't afford to take risk. If your time horizon is, look, i got 40 years to retirement, you should be nearly all in stocks taking a fair amount of risk because you can afford to ride the waves of the, of the market. Um, your long-term wealth targets, if you have higher wealth targets, all else being equal in the long term, you're going to need to take higher risk to meet those targets, so long as they're within reason. Uh, your stage of life, that determines, you know, probably part, it, it's mainly your age and where you are in terms of your, say, you know, are you, are you um, right out of college, unmarried, you know, before you own a house, it's in one stage of life. Um, then you can think of, okay, when I buy a house, you can think of that as being another stage of life and you're paying off that mortgage. You can think of another stage of life as being married um, and, 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 and having kids. Um, and and paying up through college, and then after the kids' college payments are done, you can think of uh, from that point to retirement as being a stage, and then retirement being another stage. So there's multiple stages that you can have, and it depends on the type of person and your lifestyle. And then you want to look at your financial strength. Your financial strength has to do with one, you know, how much money do you have now uh, relative to your long-term wealth goals. And then how strong is your uh, potential earnings? Uh, and you know, how stable is your job, for example? Uh, you're going to want to focus on required spending needs and your time horizon. Those are probably the biggest things uh, that are going to drive your ability to take risk. The higher the required spending needs relative to existing wealth, and the less risk the client can afford. Uh, it means let me back up. The higher the required spending needs relative to existing wealth, the less risk the client can afford to take. Okay. The shorter the time horizon, the less risk the client can afford to take. As I said before, that, con that pretty much makes sense. Um, what also makes sense, and you may not catch yourself doing this, but you may be um, in the second bullet, and the second bullet here is clients are often in a jam, and by the time they seek investment advice, um, th their their portfolios are way out of control. Um, they have expectations. You know, they, they may have lost a lot of money in their portfolio, and they're wondering, you know, can I ever retire? Um, are I ever going to have the money to buy, put a down payment on the house? Um, that happens quite frequently. And that's when um, a lot of people come knocking on the door of, of an investment advisor is at that point. They're asking, um, you know, how do I get out of this? And so often the clients, which could be you, by the way, remember, if you could be your own client, um, you may be wanting to hit a home run to try to get there, to try to, to meet your, your goals. And that's probably not the way to go. Uh, usually a more conservative approach is appropriate at that point. In StockTrack, um, what will happen is, 
you will, um, s several people in the semester will have lost a significant amount of money. They'll be down well below a million dollars, and the rest of the class is doing reasonably well, and they're going to come and they're going to ask me, you know, how do I get out of this? How do I, how do I hit a home run, basically, so I can get back there? And if you're going to try to swing for the fences, you could strike out quite easily. And that's often what I say. There's about a 50-50 chance that you do well um, and, and, and dig yourself out of the hole, so to speak. But um, a lot of people end up back into the hole, deeper into the hole. So a more conservative approach would probably make the most sense, especially in, in real life. Okay. Now, a client may be more willing to take risk, um, so we need to look at, at willingness. So we were looking at ability to take risk. We need to focus on willingness to take risk, and this willingness has to do with your intrinsic aversion to risk. Um, many clients are too conservative. They're not willing to take on much risk, even though they have the ability. And what I mean by an ability, a good example would that be you're in your early 20s, uh, and you're saving for retirement, and retirement's not till 40 years later. You have the ability to take substantial amounts of risk. That said, there's a lot of people with that ability to take risk who are unwilling to take that risk, and that's when you need to talk to your client about reconciling their ability versus their willingness you need to educate them about the harm that they're doing by taking a too conservative approach. Um, and a too conservative approach would be investing in treasury bills, for example, or money market assets for retirement when you're in your early 20s. If that's the case, the, you know, the, the funny thing is you probably won't be able to retire if you put your money in money markets and treasury bills because the return will actually uh, be negative over the long run after you account for inflation and productivity growth nearly everybody would have pulled ahead of you um, you know think about it treasury yields right now are almost zero um, and when you factor in inflation they're negative so you would actually have the you'd be better off not investing um, well I shouldn't quite say that it would just wouldn't make sense to invest in treasury bills So counseling may be required. Um, interestingly, clients may view risk differently and set their objectives accordingly. So that's one of the interesting things about risk. In, in finance, we don't have a good ability to t uh, calculate risk. I've told you that in Chapter 1. Um, we really don't know how to measure risk. And risk varies. People's view of risk, dep it depends on the person. Um, so some people take an absolute or a relative view, um, for example, and an absolute view would be, you know, I don't want to take any more than a 14% standard deviation or no more than a 10% loss in any one year. That's, it's an absolute view. Nearly nobody will tell you that in the real world in terms of a 14% standard deviation. Um, but it, it, th there are some that will actually think that way. But very few, a lot of them will tell you, you know, I don't want to lose more than 10% in any one year, and then you need to develop a, an asset allocation that's designed to, to prevent that. And, you, and the way you would do that is you'd look at historically to see how variable stocks have been, bonds, and and put together a, an asset allocation that um, minimized the possibility of a 10% loss in any one year. Um, an, another even more... Um, common approach to looking at risk is a relative risk objective and that's where your client may say you know I don't want to take any more risk than the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average and I don't want to lose more than 5% than what the Dow does for example and that's basically you know keeping up with the Joneses in terms of risk perspective um, if you think of the S&P 500 as a benchmark index that represents the US economy and the U.S. stock market, and somebody has to be holding that typical portfolio then. Um, you think of the average person as holding the S&P 500. Conceptually, you think that way. And you don't want to take any more risk than that average person. 
It's a perfectly valid way of analyzing risk. Return objectives now um, fall into two categories. There's desired returns and required returns. Desired returns are based on your client's subjective expectations. Okay, and required returns are based on your client's spending needs, existing wealth, and long-term goals. Your return objectives must be consistent with your client's risk objectives. Remember, as you, you'll see this, and you had to have seen this in your previous finance course, and you'll see it in this course throughout the semester, the more risk you take, the higher your expected return. If you don't have that thought process, there's some type of, inc it, it, it's not quite logical. You never want to take on more risk unless you expect to get a higher rate of return. So um, you need to make sure that your risk and return objectives are consistent. Okay? And if they're not, some counseling may be in order. So if you're a financial planner, you need to counsel your client. If your client is yourself, you're going to need to talk yourself into making sure that you have a consistent risk and return expectations. Okay. Um, there are other dimensions to return objectives. Return objectives could be specified in terms of real or nominal. Real means you've adjusted for inflation. Nominal means that uh, you've ignored inflation. Real is, is done often you know, in a high inflationary environment. You want to get at what's your change in purchasing power. It's a little difficult to do real because you have to estimate an inflation rate. It's usually easier to do things on a nominal ter on nominal terms, and that's typically where things people lean towards, doing things in nominal basis. Um, you can also look at returns from an absolute or relative basis. Okay. Now, you want to take into consideration it's an extremely important concept, especially if you're managing the money for somebody who is retired. And that's looking at this total return concept. Now, we looked at total return in Chapter 1, where we said, look, returns are composed of a capital gain, price appreciation or depreciation, and some income, some cash flow off of that. Now, if you're retired, some people like to keep their portfolio intact and, and uh, live off the cash flow. So you might want to have them invest more towards bonds that pay decent amounts of coupons, and high dividend yield, yielding stocks. Okay, um, that, that would be most appropriate for them. And they want to live off the income so that they don't eat away into their principal. And so they want their principal to hopefully, in in this balancing act that you're doing, you have your client spending their inc the, the cash flow that's coming off. They're keeping their principal intact, and hopefully. Their principal is appreciating in value, at least at the rate of inflation, so that their principal is not getting eaten away at the rate of inflation. Um, other return objectives could be, you know, people think, oh, I want to, and it's related to what we just talked about, capital preservation, the desire to minimize the risk of loss of principal, usually in real terms. There's capital appreciation, people who want growth. There's people who desire current income. Okay, now let's look at constraints. There's five main constraints to consider. Um, time horizon, and that drives the ability to take risk. And you can, like I talked about earlier, have multiple time horizons. Liquidity needs. The higher your liquidity needs, the lower your returns. And so if a portion of your portfolio is for retirement, you have almost no liquidity needs you can um, expect higher amounts of return by taking on high amounts of risk. If you got money allocated towards the kids' college and, and that's coming up in a few years or a down payment on a house, then your liquidity needs are high and your expected returns on those assets that you have dedicated towards those um, uh, goals will be reduced. Taxes, you want to consider taxes. This course does not really take a look at taxes much. It's especially in and of itself. So you'll have to take a course on taxes uh, as separate. There's also legal and regulatory issues, trust accounts, endowments, foundations, pensions, mutual funds. They all have bylaws, agreements, you know, rules that have to be followed. 
Um, so if you're a financial planner and you're managing endowments and foundations, you need to be aware of those rules and, and to follow them. Um, and another important aspect is unique circumstances. And the most common example, classic example of unique circumstances are, the, are people who hold large amounts of stock in a, in a particular company, usually the company they work for. And this is a constraint. This is a, this is a classic problem that shows up in the world of finance. Uh, people in, invest in the company that they work for because they think it's safe. They know the company. They're comfortable with it. And they may get options and stock uh, over time as part of their uh, benefits. And um, what's happening is you're highly concentrated, undiversified. And you're at you're you're subject to a lot of potential risk. Let me give you a, an example. Uh, the Bank of New England in the early '90s went bankrupt. You know, it was part of the real estate crash of the late '80s and early '90s. And so the Bank of New England went belly up. Well, the Bank of New England had been around for quite a long time. They had there were executives who. Um, who worked there for years and years and years had accumulated huge amounts of wealth uh, and their wage income was tied to the Bank of New England. Well, when the Bank of New England went under, not only did they lose their job, but nearly all of their existing wealth disappeared because the stock price went down to zero and the company went bankrupt. That happens and it happens, you know, it, not just bankrupt, but the stock could drop in half, which means your net worth drops in half. All else being equal, you could lose your job. So you don't want to tie your job to your, to your, uh, which is one form of wealth, to your portfolio of stocks and bonds and your retirement. Uh, it, it's not, it's just not good. It's easier said than done to convince people to, to, um, to diversify in this area. Okay, asset allocation is mainly concerned, and as we said, this is somewhat of a review here, it's mainly concerned with what asset classes to consider for investment, what policy weights, how much weight to assign each class, and then maybe you don't may, you may not want to pinpoint the weights, like, you know, I want 40% in stocks, because the minute you say I want 40% in stocks, that means you, you allocate in stock track $400,000 to stocks. Well, by tomorrow, uh, after you bought those stocks, you won't have exactly 40%. You'll have some other percent if the market went up or went down uh, relative to the rest of the 60% you have invested. So what you may want to do is put ranges in. So you might want to say, I want between 35 and 45% in stocks. And then monitor it, your portfolio. And then when you're out of that range, re readjust, rebalance your portfolio. Now I'm talking about here these weights because uh, according to research, 85 to 95 percent of your investment return and your well-being and how you know your ability to retire and your standard of living is driven by your asset allocation, assuming that you properly diversify in each asset class. So what I'm saying is those weights that I had in that previous slide where it said 10 percent cash, 40 percent stocks, you know, 30 percent bonds, those weights that you choose determine 85 to 95 percent of your overall return, provided that you're diversified in each, each you know, in, in the stock category, in the bond category, and so on. So those weights have a huge, make a huge difference in what you do. And that's, that's what the, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to tell you here. You want to make sure you have the right weights and you lean towards riskier assets if you have a long horizon and don't have liquidity needs. Here's some examples of returns um, over the past. Um, you can look at that on your own. Um, you can see common stock, long-term government bonds, treasury bonds, municipal bonds. It goes from 81 to 2007 before the financial crash. So you can think of this time period as being somewhat normal. Um, if we, if I would have went further on, and we would, you, you wouldn't have what I would consider normal circumstances in the economy. But nevertheless, they're important. 
throughout the class, we'll be talking about what's happened to the markets since the, the Great Crash and what happened during the Great Crash. That will be a subject throughout this course. But under normal circumstances, here's the, the returns that you can expect to get. Um, and then what happens when you adjust for taxes and inflation, how things kind of decline off a bit. Feedback steps. You want to monitor your portfolio in real life. You obviously want to do that in stock track and in, in, in this course throughout the semester. You're going to be doing that. You're going to be ranked against your fellow classmates. You'll be ranked against the S&P 500. You'll you'll have a good indication of where your performance is. Um, so when you have poor results, you might want to do something about it, and you might want to. You, you should be investigating what happened. Um, because in, in stock track, you're going to be writing a final report at the end of the semester that talks about um, here's the investment policy statement that I put together, here's the asset allocation I determined, here's what I executed, here's what I bought, and um, you're going to tell me did my expectations pan out or didn't they? And you're going to need to talk about that. And so when things go go awry, you need to write that up and tell me what you did to uh, rectify the situation. And so these are feedback loops. Um, now, keep in mind that all that I've said depends heavily on whether or not you're insured. You can have the greatest asset allocation, investment policy statement, and do really well in the stock market and the bond market, but if you're not properly insured, you don't have health insurance, you don't have... Um, short-term disability or long-term disability, which is measure, which is ensuring your income, and this is ensuring your, your 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 body, so to speak. And then you, and if you're not insuring your property, then you know you could have an accident. Your house could burn down. Your business could burn down. Um, you you could be hurt and out of a job. And if you don't have the insurance to pay pay off. You, everything you save could go down the tubes. So it's extremely important that you insure and, and not just monitor your portfolio, but be sure that you have the right insurance. And uh, you can take classes at USM. We have um, an area of risk management and insurance that looks at these classical forms of insurance. Um, throughout the course, we'll talk about um, um, portfolio insurance, managing and, and insuring your portfolio. And if you take it, my course in um, financial engineering using derivatives um, a lot of that course is about how to how to financially insure your portfolio using um, options and futures contracts so now what is expected of you here well I've kind of talked about it throughout this presentation um, in this class you're going to need to develop and write an investment policy statement that leads to an asset allocation strategy. It says uh, due in approximately four weeks. I think I, this semester I have it earlier. So I want to get people moving along earlier. I think they uh, students tend to drag on uh, if I give them four weeks. So it's going to be a little quicker this semester. So it could be two weeks. Um, so I want your asset allocation set and determined soon and implemented soon um, because that gives you just more time to, to use stock track and, and to learn. You're going to execute your asset allocation in stock track based on your policy statement. Okay, like I say, early in the semester, this is going to be done. You're going to monitor your portfolio, uh, monitor the markets, monitor your strategy. You could learn more strategies and then implement them throughout the semester. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with things changing. Life events happen. Remember, this is a living document, and it reflects what's going on in, in the person's life. And so, if there's some major life events, you know, you're having a, a, a you know, you're you're going to have a baby, or um, there's something happens, you know, you lost your job. Uh, these are big events that will impact your investment policy statement, and it may impact your asset allocation. So you need to consider that. Okay. So then, and now at the at the end of the semester, you'll write up a report talking about your experiences. And if your experiences are, you know, you lost a job or you got this new job that pays a great amount, and you need to adjust your asset allocation and your strategy and what you're investing in. Great, make the changes, but write them up so they know what why you changed it, and I can evaluate whether or not it makes sense.